So I want to start, I've been um, studying, and I'll talk a little bit about my, my initial work in this. Um, but I studied ayahuasca tourism, to give you an idea. Um, so I studied what, how Westerners engage with this, with ayahuasca shamanism. Um, and I want to start with this um, quote by Michael Tausig. Um, it's kind of a definition, one of my favorite definitions of shamanism, a term that's really, really hard to pin down, honestly. Um, so he says, shamanism, a made up modern Western category, an artful reification of disparate practices, snatches of folklore and overarching folklorizations, residues of long established myths intermingled with the politics of academic departments, curricula, conferences, journal juries and articles, funding agencies, and so forth. And I like this definition because he involves academics in this, mm -hmm. in this construction. Well, you'll see why. Um, so one of the most fascinating things in the study of shamanism uh, that I found over the years is this geneal genealogy of Western approaches to it. And I think his um, definition is, um, like I said, a great uh, kind of, in makes everyone complicit. Um, so the Western fascination with shamanism, uh, both academic and popular, has been oscillated between two extremes, I found. Uh, uh, approaches to shamanism in the past have been one-sided, either romanticizing or demonizing shamanism. Um, a recent scholarship, however, has been focusing on shamanism more holistically, looking at both healing and violent elements, um, and the historical and political context. Um, there's, for example, Robin Wright's book, uh, I mean, edited volume on, in Darkness and Secrecy with Neil Whitehead, and then a more recent volume on shamanism and violence by Diana Riboli and uh, Davide Tori. Um, so to, to make a long story short, the globalization of ayahuasca shamanism poses certain challenges and concern, concerns about representation that I wanna touch on, on in this talk. Um, just very briefly, in case you know you don't know what we mean by ayahuasca, it's a hallucinogenic plant mixture consumed in the form of a brew, which is prepared by the stems of Banisteria obsiscapi, which is pictured here, um, combined with the leaves of Psychotria viridis in order to induce a hallucinogenic effect. Um, the the capi vine is indigenous to the western and northwestern Amazon. Uh, but its use has expanded globally through some syncretic Brazilian churches, as well as the phenomenon I researched, which I call shamanic tourism. Um, so a little bit, I mean, Jean pretty much covered this base. Uh, traditionally, uh, in indigenous Amazonian shamanism, ayahuasca had many uses, you know, healing being just a small part of it. Among different ethnic groups, it was used in communal rituals of men, singing and dancing, for locating game, animals, and divination, uh, in warfare and conflict, to see faraway places, and you know, for healing by communicating with spirits. It's, it was important in native art, cosmology, and ethno-astronomy, and in the jaguar complex um, described by uh, Rahel Dolmatov. Um, my own research was around Iquitos. Um, sorry, I don't have a map, but it's in the Peruvian Amazon. Um, and um, this paper is based on research that started with my dissertation field work and has evolved um, into an ongoing project, fo focusing mainly on, like I said, this interculturality, the relationship between Westerners and, and how they engage with, with this. Um, so the larger issue I initially wanted to explore was how ayahuasca is, shamanism is constructed in different settings. Um, and more specifically, I wanted to answer the question, why do Westerners pursue shamanic experiences and how are these experiences constructed in the context of shamanic tourism? Currently, I'm working on a book on sorcery as it is conceptualized by uh, one of the gringo shamans, um, which means a Westerner who became a shaman. Um, a little bit about the history, because as Jean pointed out, history is important to understand how, how it has shaped shamanism as we know it today. So Iquitos was founded in 1757 um, by missionaries. The name comes from an ethnic group in the area. Um, it became, in 1864, it became an important port because of its strategic location. It used to be on the Amazon River. And I say it used to be because rivers sometimes move their course. Um, 
so uh, it was uh, the most important period from this is the, the the rubber boom era. That was a very brutal period that changed the ethnic landscape of, of the of the area. Um, it was very exploitative for uh, indigenous peoples. Um, and today, um, the tourism brings the most important revenue in the area. Uh, and ayahuasca tourism is a big part of it. So I, I want, want to emphasize that, that there is not a lot of uh, cash generating opportunities right, for indigenous peoples or mestizos for that matter in the area. Uh, so the, in my dissertation, I argued that I do not see shamanic tourism as an anomaly, but, but as consistent with the nature of shamanic knowledge, which has always been exchanged across and between cultures. Um, traditionally, in South American shamanism, power and symbolism have been sought outside a particular cultural milieu. Um, moreover, in the West, esoteric knowledge has always has often been sought in faraway places. You know, where there's always the, the allure of the exotic. Um, I also found commonalities with pilgrimage in that Western participants pursue these experiences for healing and personal transformation, the two central themes of pilgrimages cross-culturally. Um, anthropologists such as Peter Gao uh, have argued that ayahuasca shamanism with a focus on healing is a result of colonialism and a response to a brutal history, see the rubber boom, especially especially during those really brutal uh, periods. Uh, it is not, to me, it is not only clear that colonialism has played an important role in the development of ayahuasca shamanism as we know it, with the focus on healing, um, but as recent debates show that I'm gonna kind of briefly touch upon, the globalization of ayahuasca shamanism continues to transform it. Um, Something that I find fascinating is that, is that something was, that was meant to heal the effects of colonial encroachments, um, paradoxically today, is healing our ailments, and I mean by our in, in the West, right? And Iquitos is, just to give you a visual, is, is a really paradoxical place where modernity coexists with, with the universe of this, uh, these fantastical tales, um, Amazonian myths and folk tales are very revealing, not only of the worldview of the people who created them, but they also reveal traces of historical trauma. Um, such as examples are the stories of spirits uh, that will eat people's fat uh, or steal their organs. They're called pistacos in Peru. Um, and of pink dolphins transforming into gringos. Uh, and an, an, an artistic rendition of this is the, the last image on this slide. Um, some of these stories reflect anxieties of uh, foreigners, uh, strangers, foreign predators. Um, and it's, I, I like to point this out because many of us engaging with ayahuasca shamanism forget that in, the, in these stories we are, we are the white foreigners. We are, we are those predators. You know, it's kind of um, interesting to reflect on that. Um, so the one, the, the th one of the most interesting things I found, um, you know, in the literature, I think Jean Langdon has actually influenced a lot of this. Um, uh, shamans have an ambiguous position in society, in uh, Amazonian indigenous society, right? We, uh, Westerners tend to, to perceive shamans as these wise old uh, men, um, but really, they, they have an ambiguous position um, because they may employ power in negative ways, especially when they direct it against enemies outside of their social group. Uh, their sources from where shamans appropriate their power are ambivalent because um, they have the power both to heal and, and kill. Um, according to much Amazonian ethnography, it is not uncommon for shamans to engage, to engage in shamanic rivalries, wars, and duplicity. So if you think about it in indigenous Amazonian societies, the shaman's position is not an enviable one. Uh, they have no real power or more resources than anybody else in the community. Um, in essence, they serve their communities and have an ambivalent position they're, where they're, they're at the same time respected and feared. Um, and since they're both capable of healing and destruction, um, how what they do is perceived depends on context. Um, a context that many Westerners engaging with this are oblivious of. I, I was for a long time, right? I'm not excluding myself from this. Um, 
<laughs> but with Western interests, some individual shamans have been elevated by foreigners, either because they make more money or because they're approached as these wise gurus or teachers. So the question I've been asking in recent years is, what is the effect of this dynamic on indigenous peoples and the shamanic traditions themselves? Um, and an aspect of Amazonian shamanism that is often difficult for Westerners to, diver to digest is that of sorcery. Um, it has been argued uh, about sorcery that it reveals a lot of social tensions. Um, in, in this case, possible, a, a lot about social relations. Um, and in this case, about social tensions, really. Um, so according to much of the anthropologi uh, anthropological literature, sorcery accusations and practice um, increases in zones where there is pressure, poverty and competition over limited resources, especially in zones created as a result of colonial processes. And you see why the historical um, um, context is important. Um, so it, it seems that in, in areas like this, that modernity has not eradicated irrational beliefs, so-called irrational beliefs, but rather exacerbated them. Um, let's see. So I'm moving to something a little different. Um, but currently, so as I already alluded, currently discourse on shamanism is going through a fascination phase, as I like to call it, possibly mainstreaming phase even, um, which comes with its own perils. Many celebrities are promoting ayahuasca. It, it appears on TV shows. I mean, it's really hard to not um, see something um, that mentions ayahuasca in the media these days. Um, it, uh, this, this discourse is ignoring uh, certain elements that are less digestible, like sorcery. Um, and all of this is understandable, if you think about it, considering the legal situation with these plants. Even scholars researching ayahuasca don't want to overemphasize or overpromote these negative aspects, fearing a backlash. Right? Um, so what I've seen among Western ayahuasca participants is a tendency to reinforce stereotypes. Stereotype. Indigenous peoples are perceived as close to nature, wise and spiritual, the, you know, the ecological Indian. Um, but I'm arguing that even positive stereotypes can be harmful. Um, an example of this um, is this exhibit, no, Jimmy Nelson's exhibit and book. Um, what many Westerners who are looking for guidance or direction from indigenous cultures we don't, do not realize um, is that indigenous peoples do not live in some harmonious state with nature, but are people embedded in larger struggles and face important challenges, one of which is the way they're represented. Right? For example, a reaction to this, to this exhibit. I mean, there was some pretty... Uh, harsh reactions to, to this exhibit by indigenous peoples. One is this example. The, the indigenous people said, well, excuse me, we're not dying, we're right here. We've, had the, we've heard this a lot before in this conference, actually, which is great. Um, another one is by Davi Kopenawa, uh, a Yanomamo shaman who, like other shamans, has emerged as a, not only spiritual but also political leader for his peoples and um, kind of a mediator with um, uh, the larger larger society, right? So the point I want to make is this, that rom romanticizing indigenous knowledge is not benign in the sense that a one-sided romantic image hides the complexity of indigenous people's situation. It erases injustices that indigenous people have experienced and continue to experience. For example, you know, I have many examples of this. I'll just give you this one. <laughs> of uh, you know, four environmental activists that were killed um, a year and a half ago. Um, so a lot of um, activists like this ones who have spoken, uh, like the ones that have spoken at this conference actually, um, who do this work to protect their land uh, and, and their well-being uh, are actually risking their lives, literally. This is not a joke. Um, at the same time, again, switching to something different, at the same time, Westerners fascinated by shamanism flock centers like this one uh, with an incredible array of amenities, including a pool in the middle of the jungle, to have authentic shamanic experiences and to connect to ancient spiritual traditions while healing themselves. Our critics uh, comment on the long history of exploitation of indigenous people and will even go as far as to label such forms of commercial commercialization and appropriation of indigenous knowledge um, for outsiders use 
as cultural imperialism. Uh, critics such as Wallace point out that neo-shamans tend to take knowledge from indigenous people and not give something in return. Uh, places like the one picture, pictured train uh, Westerners or shamans or facilitators as they call them, um, and to gain legitimacy, they claim to do it with the permission of indigenous peoples. The Kofan, from whom the proprietor of this organization claimed had permission to do this, issued a statement denouncing his activities and was supported by many academics. Um, scholars such as um, Vitebsky have noted that New Age and its cosmopolitanism moves away from cosmology by dissolving the realm of the religion, of the religious. Um, he also argues New Age adopts certain elements of indigenous knowledge, such as shamanism. Its full, its full implications are too challenging, even for radicals to accommodate. Um, so, shamanism in this context, you know, this globalized context, loses its com cosmological significance that it had um, traditionally. Right? And I realize that traditional is a problematic term, but. Um, so what I'm arguing is that oh yeah, uh, despite good intentions and the fact that Westerners are having meaningful and transformative experiences, there is the real danger of the erasure of indigenous people's plights and injustices against them. Indigenous healing systems um, focus on restoring balance, not only in the patient's body, but in the family and their community. Um, and more recently, shamanic revitalizations, like the one that uh, Jean Langdon talked about, have become about restoring identity, finding value in indigenous traditions, and re restoring dignity and well-being. Um, at the same time that ayahuasca shamanism has expanded globally and is used in a variety of settings and reinvented as a healing and transformational tool, some indigenous communities around Iquitos have not used it in decades. Um, during a recent vis visit of a Kukama community in the Peruvian Amazon, the one you see here, I discovered that there were no shamans in the community. They did not use nor cultivate ayahuasca for decades. Um, and one, man, one young man who uh, was trained to be, to be a shaman through dreams, um, as there were no elders to teach him. Uh, the community's biggest concern was how to generate income by preserving their traditional knowledge, language, and land. Uh, intact through ecotourism. And I wouldn't be surprised if I see shamanism become, uh, g being revitalized and maybe being part of this ecotourism <laughs> operation um, and being used to generate income, right? Um, on another visit uh, to an indigenous school training bilingual te teachers, I saw the need to not only revitalize indigenous languages, but also to recover dignity for indigenous peoples and revalorize their medicinal knowledge. And it was interesting to see these signs. Um, again, Jean talked about how it was, for a long time, there was a lot of racism and a lot of, um, um, so imagine the psychological impact of being ashamed to be who you are, right? So there is this um, very conscious attempt to, to bring back that self-esteem. So they had these signs in the school that said, don't be offended when someone calls you indigenous or indigenous dignity, um, this kind of thing. So um, this, it, it was really telling, it was really touching for me. Um, so meanwhile, again, going back to the controversies, there seem to be a lot of conflict regarding the future of ayahuasca use and who are or should be its legitimate protectors. A recent controversy pertained to the goals of this NGO who aimed for a safer and more sustainable ayahuasca. One of the reasons they became so controversial among academics um, and you know, the, some of that critique was valid, but one of the things that kind of stood out to me was that their report, that in their report, um, the, the NGO's report, they aimed for including indigenous communities as stakeholders um, and figure out ways to develop sustainable ayahuasca tourism in their communities. This was perceived um, as neoliberal or neocolonialist discourse, uh, and some opponents claimed that this would commercialize ayahuasca. Something that I have seen in my work is already very commercialized. Um, but apparently there was some discomfort with if this is done by indigenous peoples. 
Um, so cases like this, and I'm very simplifying this a lot, but cases like this made me worried that even among academics, we might be essentializing indigenous peoples and assume we know better what is good or proper for them. It reminded me of this documentary, At the Edge of Conquest. It made me realize that uh, a strange thing happens when indigenous peoples exhibit agency. They immediately are perceived as unscrupulous or worse. It reminds me of the Brazilian government official in this documentary who tells the Wayapi who are trying to navigate the Brazilian bureaucracy to protect their land from miners that it would be detrimental for their cause if they were to take things into their own hands and God forbid commit any violence against the miners. Um, he advises them ber verbatim to remain victims to advance their cause. Uh, I wonder where the same sentiment is echoed when people are appalled when indigenous peoples themselves commercialize ayahuasca. It is perceived as compromising authenticity or in other cases is used as an argument by the people who might be commercializing ayahuasca themselves. They kind of say, well, if they do it, so can we. Um, so as usual, indigenous peoples are found in this impossible position where they can't win unless they conform to stereotypes. So in conclusion, um, when indigenous knowledge is appropriated, it takes on the fragmentary nature of our society. This is a quote by Vitebsky. So global culture seems unable to capture the holistic nature of indigenous knowledge because there is a lack of context for belief and application. Um, I, I caution that this might contribute to the further mar marginalization of indigenous knowledge, something that should be taken seriously. The history of shamanism and indigenous peoples around Iquito shows that shamanism is a response to outside forces and a brutal and violent history. Westerners who want to have a more meaningful exchange with the traditions they admire should keep that in mind. It's also important to know that Westerners, to note that Westerners engaging with these traditions come from a position of privilege. I'm including myself again in this. Um, Disenfranchised Peruvians, indigenous or not, have little to no choice, as often shamanic tourism is the most lucrative or only source of income at a time that their land and resources have been stripped away. Thank you.